though, to Acts chapter 15. And as you do that, let me explain a burden that Aaron and I had after we studied a couple of weeks ago the message on Acts chapter 15. We felt like the Lord laid on our hearts a burden about the importance of this topic of grace and legalism, so much so that we felt it would be valuable to, to linger on that topic for a few weeks. Uh, we, we obviously are in the middle of a series in Acts. We'll continue that effectively in the new year. We're going to have a couple of weeks looking into, in more detail, some of the application points that I brought up last week. So if you remember last week, I talked about the, the importance of upholding, defending grace, that being a key theme in Acts chapter 15 with this great council in Jerusalem. And I talked about how one of the ways, a number of ways that we do that is we uphold grace in how we read the scriptures, especially the Old Testament. We uphold grace in our relationship with God and our view of godliness and how we relate to others. Well, we want to take a number of weeks to look at those different topics, to allow this topic of the grace of God to press deeply into our hearts, into our thinking, to evaluate whether it is truly a grace-centered Christian life that we are living? Is it, is it affecting the way we think in terms of these details? And we, we just felt like with especially those four different categories, they're, they're just so important. They're so central that, that we didn't want to keep moving without lingering and studying them in more depth. So this morning, we're going to look at that first topic that we uphold the, the grace of God in particular in how we read the scriptures and especially the Old Testament. So we want to study that this morning. We want to look at that in detail. So just to remind you a little bit, I, I just want to read one verse, very precious verse out of Acts 15. Acts 15, 11, if you remember the context is there has been this demand that the Gentiles be circumcised and fulfill, obey the full law of Moses. There is an argument going on in Jerusalem among those who oppose and say that that is not God's will for them. And Peter stands up in that hall and speaks a number of words against that demand. And at the conclusion, uh, he says this very, very precious word in verse 11. But we believe that we will be saved. And here's the key phrase. I'll pause for a moment. Or longer than a moment. Or... All right, hang on, I'm being, I have instructions. Struggling as well, is that better? Is it all fuzzy and messed up and everything, or is it okay? Much better? Okay, all right, hang on, let me take this whole contraption off me. All right. All right, let me reread this. Very important phrase, so we don't lose the value of it. <laughs> Acts chapter 15, verse 11. We believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. We will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. That is our prayer, that we will see the truth of that statement and we will apply it to all these different categories of our life. So Lord, I pray that you would bless this little mini-series that we feel you have led us to do. Help us to see the glory of your grace, to trust it fully and completely. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had one of those nagging thoughts uh, right before you drift off to sleep uh, that maybe your door is not locked or something is still on in the house. Uh, I, I have that kind of thought all the time. And you're, you're there, at least in my experience, I argue with myself about it. And I say, no, I'm sure, I, certainly, I locked the door. I, I, I'm sure I did. I would not have come upstairs without locking the door. I think I did. And usually it's a futile argument because usually I'm there and I'm trying to drift off to sleep and this nagging thought just keeps coming into my mind. What if you didn't? 
Well, and probably nothing would happen, but there's a sense of vulnerability, right? What if you didn't? What if you're imagining it? What if you've got it wrong? What if you just think you did that, but it isn't actually locked? And almost always, almost always, I can't go to sleep until I get up and I go downstairs and I look and yep, sure enough, sure enough, we are as secure as a little piece of metal can make us. We are secure. Yes, we are. Yes, I did. I, I see it and I believe it and now I can lay back and go to sleep confident of our security. Have you ever had that happen to you? I, I've had, when I, I can't go to sleep. I can't rest until this nagging thought is resolved. I'm vulnerable because this nagging thought will not let me rest. I think that that's what it's like with grace sometimes. We, we believe it. We're, we're sure it's true. I, I know it's true. I've, I've read verses. I've heard sermons. I, I know it's true. But there's a nagging thought. Am I, am I sure I'm saved by the grace of God alone? Am I sure of that? And that's true in many areas, which we'll talk about in the coming weeks, but it is definitely true when we think about the Old Testament. There can be a nagging thought, am I sure? Am I sure? I, I think many Christians have, have, in many places, not even read the entire Old Testament, certainly have not studied aspects of it in great depth, but when they have opened, it's full of strange commands, and since it's about two-thirds of our Bible, it can be unsettling. Because this whole Bible lays on our lap Sunday after Sunday. We open to it and we can have this nagging thought like me there trying to drift off to sleep. Am I, am I, am I sure that two-thirds of my Bible really is about for me the grace of God? Am I sure of that? And I think for many Christians it's that nagging thought that just bothers them at the back of our minds. Maybe grace is just a preference. Maybe I'm a Christian the way I am simply because it's easier to be that way. Maybe I'm just that way because that's the way my parents were Christians. Or I look around at the church and I see a lot of people who seem equally comfortable being a Christian that way. Or I just feel better thinking about Christianity that way. And I, I'd rather not read all those books in the Old Testament. And frankly, when I do, I don't get a lot out of them and it scares me a little bit. Very different from going down and looking at it and saying, yes, grace. The Old Testament, rightly understood, communicates we will be saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. There's a difference between, I think it's true, I hope it's true, I sure wish I could know if it's true, and saying, it is true. Isn't there a difference in your soul? Don't you sleep better once that's been resolved? I'm hoping that I can at least point you in the direction of a greater resolve on that point this morning through the scriptures, that we can study them away, I can maybe set us up in a way that we view the Old Testament in such a way that our confidence that verse 11 of chapter 15 in Acts is true, and it is true according to the testimony of the entire scriptures that the entire scriptures bear witness to chapter 15, verse 11, we will be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm praying that that confidence comes to our souls and that we can read the Old Testament joyfully, eagerly, gratefully, with great benefit to us, not because it's always easy to understand, but because it commends the grace of God to us. That's what I'm hoping. I want to make three points this morning, and they sort of build on each other. So if you want to think of this as a, a message with a long intro of two points and then a one-point message or a three-point message, uh, you could do it any way you want. But I have these two kind of introductory points, and then I have a final point that I want to linger on, okay? So let me, let me just kind of teach us through this a little bit, all right? First, first point, either by introduction or my first point, however you want to think about it, the New Testament, get ready for this, okay? The New Testament is God's Word, all right, <laughs> you ready for that this morning? The New Testament is God's word. Now, I trust that if you're a Christian, you believe that. That's really important to believe. The New Testament is God's word. 
Why do we think that? Why do we know that? Well, the New Testament claims for itself to be the Word of God, but I want to reference a couple of verses that I think teach us that the New Testament is the Word of God. Why do we believe that? Why is it so central to our faith in Christ to believe that it is God's very Word? First, John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, answering, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's why that verse is so important to the New Testament. Jesus is the central focus of the New Testament, okay? So when you read the Gospels, there are four Gospels that talk about Jesus. They're all about his life, death, resurrection. They quote him extensively, and then the people that wrote the majority of the rest of the New Testament were those that were eyewitnesses to him or others that heard from them about Jesus. Here's how this logic goes together. If the New Testament is not God's word, having quoted Jesus and having quoted those that Jesus chose to represent him, then we have no hope of salvation at all. If the New Testament is not God's word, then Jesus was not true or he is so impotent as to choose people who can misrepresent him and therefore we would have no hope of salvation. So I I know the vast majority here certainly believe this, but it's important to understand. There is no rejecting the New Testament, which is about Jesus, without rejecting the truthfulness of Jesus himself. And if you reject the truthfulness of Jesus, you have no hope of a Savior who is the way, the truth, and the life. Another verse. Let me just build on this. Acts 1.8 says, Quoting Jesus, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So if we were to reject the New Testament as God's word, including all of the witnesses of the apostles and Paul, who was affirmed by them as a witness of Jesus, we would have to trace it back and say, Jesus is either untruthful or incapable of choosing truthful witnesses. You see where we're going with this? So you you can't pick and choose. Either there is no truthful Savior or the New Testament is God's very word because Jesus is the word, God the Son in the flesh. The New Testament is the word of God. And even explicit reference in 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Here we have Peter, Jesus' chosen leader of his early disciples, talking about Paul who wrote the vast majority of the letters in the New Testament. And he says this, Our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given, wisdom given to him as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. Thank you, Peter. Makes me feel better. Which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. But listen to this phrase. As they do the other scriptures. So already in the first century, Peter considers the writings of Paul to be on a par with Isaiah, to be just as much God's word as Leviticus, just as much God's word as Genesis. So he considers Paul writing scripture to be in the same category as Moses writing scripture. Now, you'll see where we're going, why this is so important. The New Testament is God's word. If it is not God's word, then Jesus cannot be the Messiah because he is an untruthful liar who chose untruthful witnesses to represent him. The New Testament is God's word. There are those today. There are those. Even today, it's been true throughout the history of the church, and there are those today who would claim that a significant portion of the New Testament is not the Word of God. But such a teaching calls into into question the competency, if not the very legitimacy, of the chosen witnesses of Jesus, and therefore of Jesus himself. The New Testament claims to be representing God. Since Jesus is God the Son, the Word of God, and since he handpicked his witnesses, and since the early church bore witness to these writings being clearly, clearly the self-authenticating Word of God, when we read Mark and Luke and Matthew and John and the quotes of Jesus and the letters of Paul and the apocalypse of John and all the rest, we are reading God's Word to us. The New Testament is the Word of God. Now, fix that in your mind. Remember, we're down there staring at the door, right? We're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere, but fix that in your mind. The New Testament is the Word 
of God. God who knows all things, who knows the Old Testament, who knows the New Testament, who knows the future, who knows the past. The New Testament is God's word. Point number two. The New Testament regularly tells us how to interpret the Old Testament for today. The New Testament regularly tells us how to interpret the Old Testament for today. Now let's let's get this set in our minds. It is God's word. So God is speaking. God is saying this. And regularly, regularly throughout the New Testament, it references the Old Testament and then tells us how to interpret it. Tells us how it should be applied and understood today. Sometimes in surprising ways. But it claims to have the right to say to us, here is how you understand the Old Testament scriptures for today. And it is God saying that to us. G.K. Beale, an author I would recommend to you on this topic especially, says, One writer has counted 295 separate quotations of the Old Testament. These are quotations of the Old Testament in the New Testament, including quotations with and without formulas. These make up about 4.5% of the entire New Testament, about 352 verses. Thus, one out of every 22.5 verses in the New Testament incorporates a quotation. The New Testament writers believed that the Old Testament was the word of God and that they were given authority to interpret it for our situation today. Beale also says there is anywhere from 600 to over 1,000, some people claim multiple thousand allusions to the Old Testament. We might think of places where images or concepts are used even if a direct quotation is not. So you might think of John the Baptist declaring to the crowds, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Obviously an allusion to the Old Testament, though he's not directly quoting something. Let's think of some of the examples of how the New Testament regularly tells us how to interpret the Old Testament. We have specific passages and their ultimate purpose. So, very familiar in this time of year, the birth of Jesus. Speaking about Jesus' birth, Matthew 1, 22-23 says, All this, all this about Jesus, took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So here you have Matthew, who is quoting and then applying the meaning of Isaiah to the birth of Jesus. He's saying what God was saying in Isaiah was ultimately fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. That is how we are to read that passage in Isaiah today. So it's claiming the right to interpret for us an Old Testament passage. Or we have Pentecost, which we recently studied. Peter speaking in Acts 2. But this, all this that had happened, the pouring of the Spirit, the coming of the Spirit to the church, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. So here's what Peter doing. He's quoting Joel and he's saying, this, this situation is how we should apply the meaning, the ultimate meaning of Joel. So he's preaching. He's preaching from Joel, and he's saying this is what Joel was talking about. This and not something else. This is the right application of the prophet Joel today. And you can keep going. You can think of Paul in Romans 3, quoting the Psalms to describe the degeneration of mankind as a context for his explanation that the righteousness provided by Jesus um, is what ultimately fulfills our standing before God. So he's quoting the Psalms and saying that is the context for the coming of Jesus and the righteousness he provides. Or you have Paul in Galatians declaring that since the faith of Abraham preceded the work of circumcision, faith preceding works is God's permanent order in the life of his people. Think about that. He's reading Genesis and he's saying here's what we're supposed to get from the order of Genesis. Since Abraham first had faith and then had the work of circumcision, we are to understand that that is always the way God works with his people. You have Paul quoting the Old Testament and declaring this is what it means for you. You must understand it this way to agree with God. 
Or you have Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount declaring that he will amplify the teaching of the Old Testament about adultery and murder to include lust and anger. And expecting, expecting that his followers will accept his amplified application as having divine authority. Jesus is not making a suggestion about anger. He's saying, this is how you are to understand today in me what it says in the Old Testament about murder. You are to understand it as having even a reach into the heart of a man who is angry. Or you have his surprising statement in Mark chapter 7 that contrary to the food laws of Leviticus, it is ultimately true that what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. And Mark comments and says, thus he declared all foods clean. So that apparently there was a temporary nature to those food laws to anticipate Jesus saying cleanless is a matter for the whole of life and not just for certain dietary restrictions. And Jesus is claiming to have authority to apply that passage to our lives in a particular way. Remember, go back to our, our first point. The New Testament is God's word. And it regularly, being God's word, tells us how to apply the Old Testament today. We have, for example, the Jerusalem Council, which we just studied, declaring contrary to the Old Testament law in that season that it is no longer necessary for Gentiles to be circumcised for their conversion. And quoting the prophet Amos in support of that decision, saying that was God's intention all along. You have the writer of Hebrews declaring that the blood of bulls and goats, which were required in the Old Testament, were never intended to permanently take away sin, and that they have now been replaced by the permanent sacrifice of Jesus Christ. What's he doing? He's looking at the Old Testament. He's saying this was a temporary provision, and now we are to apply it in seeing the fulfillment of Jesus. He's telling us how to read our Old Testament. Then you have verses that are broad that define the summary purpose of the whole Old Testament. John uh, says this, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me, Jesus speaking. And yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. He's condemning the Jews who have rejected him. He's saying, you, you're searching the scriptures, but you're missing their point. And he's talking about the Old Testament. The point of Isaiah is Jesus. The point of Leviticus is Jesus. The point of Deuteronomy is Jesus. He's saying you are searching them for life, but you are missing me as the source of life in them. Luke 24, 25, he said, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ, necessary, very important word in the New Testament, it means divine necessity. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning, listen to this, with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them, look at that word, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself the New Testament is God's word the New Testament regularly tells us how to interpret the Old Testament it claims that authority from God God has repeatedly given interpretation of his own word to people living on this side of the coming of Christ Now, this is a moment where we have to recognize the difference between God and us. Because I know there are, there are people, and there have been throughout the history of the church, that say, well, God's not allowed to apply certain things to his people in one season and then to change that application in a different season. The New Testament says, yes, he is. Yes, he is. And he did. He plainly did. He clearly did. He explicitly said that he did and said that's how we should apply those scriptures as well. The New Testament regularly tells us how to interpret the Old Testament for people living on this side of the coming of Jesus Christ. If the New Testament is God's word, so God is telling us how to interpret the Old Testament scriptures for today. Sometimes I think pe people sort of pit God against God. 
Well, yeah, but God said this in the Old Testament. Yes, but we forget God invented time. God knew when Jesus was going to come. God knew that he would come before he chose Abraham. God didn't create a people and then realize this is never going to work. We're going to have to send you down there. No, that's the way we would do it. It's like, like Edison. I, I learned 99 ways to not make a light bulb, and then I finally discovered. That's how sometimes we think of Jesus. Well, he tried 99 ways to save people. None of them worked. So then he sent Jesus. And, oh, Eureka, we found it. Here it is. We'll send the sun. And he'll save everybody. And, and No, no. We believe in a sovereign, eternal God who is timeless. And so from the beginning, when he chose Abraham, he chose him with a view of his fulfillment in Christ. He intended to do this in a preparatory way. This wasn't the 98th time he said, okay, what can we... Wait, but hey, we have you. Let's send you down. No, no. He was intending all along. That's why that word fulfillment is so important. Fix those in your minds. The New Testament is God's word. The New Testament regularly tells us, repeatedly, pervasively tells us how to interpret the Old Testament. Now, we don't have in the New Testament a commentary on every verse of the Old Testament. I would have loved to be there with Jesus when he's walking on the road to Emmaus and talking through all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. But we do have a vastly sufficient number of interpreted verses to give us a very trustworthy guide for how we should interpret the Old Testament today. We don't have every verse commented on, but we have virtually every kind of verse commented on in ways that help us to apply the rest of them as well. All right, section number three. The New Testament indicates that the coming of Christ both fulfilled and transformed the application of the Old Testament for us. That's how I would summarize. If you think about all those verses of interpretation, I would say this. The the New Testament indicates that the coming of Christ both fulfilled and transformed the application of the Old Testament for us. Let me look at those two things one at a time. Fulfillment. The New Testament consistently refers to the Old Testament as anticipating or predicting or preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ. So there is no way you can read the New Testament and say that the coming of Jesus was a secondary plan that was not in view when God laid the groundwork on the Old Testament. You simply cannot believe that and hold to the consistent teaching of the Old Testament or the New Testament about the fulfillment of that, that God brought this about to fulfill, to bring to its intended end. The New Testament views the coming of Christ as God bringing about in time the culmination of the plan that he had been laying the groundwork for in all of the scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures were not a prior plan, independent from the person and work of Christ. They were a great divine prelude, complete with patterns and purposes and explicit predictions, all of which would be seen in their glory when the Messiah arrived. The word fulfill, in just the Gospels and Acts, the English word fulfill is used to translate a Greek concept. The English word fulfill is used 41 times in the Gospels and Acts, and the vast majority of these times it is in reference to the Old Testament pattern of prophecy that anticipated something that Jesus does or that his church does with reference to the work of Christ. Here's the idea. When he came, It brought about the era, the situation, the day that God was anticipating all along. In himself and in the result of his work with his people, it brought about the ultimate culmination, the pinnacle of all that God had been preparing for all along. Matthew 5, 17, very helpful in this regard. Jesus speaking says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So Jesus corrects two uh, contrary errors. One is the Old Testament speaks to us unchanged by the coming of Christ, or the Old Testament is irrelevant and should be discarded. Discarded. 
And we can see both of those tendencies in various sections of evangelicalism. The Old Testament is unchanged by the coming of Christ, or the Old Testament should be functionally discarded because the New Testament is where we really get our meat and our bread. Jesus says, no, I I didn't come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. So he honors them, and he implores us to see in himself and all that he does the fulfillment, the result, the end point, the terminus of all that God had prepared for. So that Jesus is the glory of the Old Testament scriptures and continues to be their glory. So that in them we read of him and we see his glory displayed in countless patterns and predictive prophecies and roles and we see in him their ultimate fulfillment. And we see his glory in every page of the Old Testament instructed in their, in, in their interpretation by the New Testament. He fulfilled it in that he was what it predicted. He fulfilled it in that he provided what it revealed that we needed. And he fulfilled it by ushering in and making possible its final intended application. Let me give you those three again. How did he fulfill it? How will we explain this based on what the New Testament says in in its entirety? He fulfilled it in that he was what it predicted. He provided what it revealed that we needed. And he ushered in and made possible its final intended application. He was what it predicted. He provided what it revealed that we needed. And he ushered in and made possible its final intended application. So that its current application has all of the glory of Jesus now bringing the Old Testament scriptures to us in their final, ultimate glory. They had a temporary glory before he came. And there is a final glory for them after he came. They are neither irrelevant nor to be read without reference to Christ. They are fulfilled such that their temporary purpose of preparing for Christ gives way to their ultimate purpose of being fulfilled in Christ, of showing in great depth and energy the need for and the perfection of his work and in their heart being seen in a new covenant written on the hearts of God's people. Fulfilled. Fulfilled. The New Testament indicates the coming of Christ both fulfilled and transformed. What do I mean by the transformation? We are not free. I said this two weeks ago. We are not free to read the Old Testament as if Christ had never come. And I can say this on the authority of the New Testament scriptures, on the authority of God himself. We are not free to read the Old Testament as if Christ had never come. In other words, we are not free to read it as they did before the coming of Christ. We are not free to do that. To do that is to abuse them of their final glory, their intended glory that God gave to them. And that should be seen in how we interpret them today. Let's think about some examples. There's there's countless examples. You can read them on your own. But let's think about some examples. Sacrifices for sin are permanently replaced by the sacrifice of Christ. So we are not free to read in Leviticus of the Day of Atonement and repeat a goat sacrifice for sin. But we are free to celebrate the once for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Circumcision is no longer to be done for salvation because, because we are set apart by belief in Jesus and by the mark of the Holy Spirit. So how do we look at the circumcision? We don't insist that Gentiles be circumcised to be saved, but we do say that we are the true circumcision who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. The temple must not be rebuilt because Christ is our temple and he makes his body, the church, into a temple for his spirit. Do we still consider the Passover a required feast for Christians? 
I would not recommend it because the New Testament says that Christ is our Passover lamb. Now, I'm being careful here. I'm not saying that if you have ever done a Passover feast to remember what happened in Exodus and Israel. No, I'm not saying that's, that's sinful in and of itself. But if you view it as required in the way it was required in the Old Testament, you could be neglecting the purpose of it to point to the great Passover lamb whose blood covered over our souls such that the wrath of God passed over us and was laid on him. Do Christians function as a civil government, stoning heretics and adulterers? No, no, because Jesus said his kingdom is not of this world. And Paul says we are to honor the emperor and that secular governments are used by God to punish wrongdoing. So apparently Christians are only responsible to keep the church pure, but to leave civil punishments to civil governments. A change, a change from God's purpose for Israel in the Old Testament. A change that God has the right to make. Jesus certainly could have set up Christian presidents in a Christian society. He specifically and emphatically did not do that. What about free will offerings in the Old Testament? Well, the New Testament says that our worship has become comprehensive so that our bodies are to be offered as a living sacrifice so that whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, it is done for the glory of God. So when we read those passages, we can think, well, yes, I'm sure that was difficult to give a portion. We are to give all. Do we view the feasts and the festivals of the Old Testament as mandated? Well, Paul says in Colossians that these things, days and feasts, are a shadow of the things to come. And the force of his argument is, don't fall in love with the shadow. See the substance, the substance that the shadow was meant to anticipate. The light of God's revelation shone from the future on the person and work of Christ and backwards into history, the shadow of his coming was seen in the Old Testament scriptures. And falling in time, we walked and we saw that shadow and we were to, to obey or respond to it during that time. But then we come to the substance and he says, don't fall in love with the shadow. See in the shadow the anticipation of the substance himself. What about the moral commands? Well, the New Testament not only holds that those laws are continuing in Christ, the moral commands, but actually amplifies them as having an amplified application in the new era of Christ in which we live. We are not only not to murder, we are to love our enemies. We are not only not to commit adultery, we are not even to lust in honor of our Savior. Moral commands seem to be amplified to heart requirements in the new day of Christ. New Testament is God's word. The New Testament tells us how to interpret the Old Testament, which means God has the right to say, do not offer goats, don't be angry. Now, my goal cannot be to go through every point of the law, but to make the point that the New Testament teaches us that the law has been transformed by the coming of Christ Jesus. And when you read the Old Testament with Christ lenses on, oh, they are transformed to show all of his glory, they still motivate us to love God, but they, they do that in a way that is bathed in the light of the glory of Jesus Christ. Now reading the Old Testament, it's like going back to the island where all the treasure was buried, except that you have the map and the key and even a guide to show all the glorious treasure and where it is. It's a different island now. So when we read that the Lord remembered Noah and Genesis, we bear in mind that God remembered us by sending us a way of salvation from his righteous judgment. Because Peter says in Noah, there was a metaphor of the coming of Jesus Christ. We read in, in Genesis that God provided a ram in the thicket so that Isaac would not have to die. We remember with joy that God provided the lamb, Jesus Christ, so that all of God's people represented in Isaac would not have to die in their sins either. When we read David's prayer in Psalm 51, that God would be merciful to him, in spite of his atrocious sin, we remember that God's mercy still comes to us through David's greater son and that a greater king named Jesus died so that our sin would not keep us forever 
from God's presence. When we read in Isaiah 53 about the lamb that went silent to the slaughter for the sins of the people, or we read about the countless sacrifices that are represented in Leviticus and how when the priest offers atonement through the death of this animal, they will be forgiven, we think of the great and perfect lamb who went unblemished to the altar of God's wrath on the cross, suffered for my sin and your sin, and there he fully absorbed the wrath of God so that God says to us, us, your sins are forgiven. We read about the temple that people could approach but not enter fully. We see the glory of the new temple where God himself dwells within us and meets us wherever we are with full access granted in Jesus Christ. When we read the Old Testament scriptures about a people set apart to be God's precious possession, we don't just think of Abraham. We think about how we've been set apart by the blood of Jesus Christ, stamped with the very presence of God and chosen to be his royal priesthood on this earth. And that because of him, we can draw near by faith, unworthy and undeserving, but clothed in the righteousness of our great high priest, who is much better than Aaron and bears us before the presence of God, unblemished by his own sin and gives us permanent access there and will finally bring us there into God's unveiled presence in glory brothers and sisters if the New Testament is God's word and it is and if it tells us how to interpret the Old Testament scriptures and it does then the Old Testament is opened up for us as a glorious treasure house showing all that Jesus accomplished and did in fulfillment of those scriptures. Now, I am not meaning to say that there are no parts that it's difficult to see exactly how did Jesus fulfill this. And I understand Christians could have legitimate disagreements about some parts of the Old Testament. So the Sabbath, for example, Is the Sabbath like, do not murder, it continues, or is it like, don't offer the goat anymore? Not tons about the Sabbath. It seems to me as though Paul says in Colossians that it is not to be a required category for Christians. But I understand how people could disagree. Could there be other things that you would look in the Old Testament, okay, is this, is this a moral command that's amplified or is, is this a ceremonial command that's sort of done away with or spiritualized in Christ? I understand. There could be aspects that are hard. But the more we study how the New Testament teaches us about the Old Testament, the clearer and clearer we will be and the fewer and fewer of those confusing passages there will be and the more and more of those passages that just speak to us about the glory of Jesus Christ and the good news that we have, that we can live trusting and obeying and following him. So go down into that Old Testament doorway and look at it with the light of the New Testament shining over your shoulder and discover the truth. We are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus and his coming fulfilled and transformed the Old Testament scriptures not to abolish them but so that they can be read in their own ultimate glory, their grown-up glory, their fully matured glory, no longer treated as a child with a temporary provision, but as an adult, a grown adult shown in their glory in the fullness of Jesus Christ. The goal of all of this, for me, talking about the scriptures, is so that you can rest. Rest. 
is so that when that nagging thought comes to mind, am I sure I'm secure in Jesus? You can say, on the authority of God's word, yes, I am. Yes, I am. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, yes, you are. If you don't believe in Jesus, that door is unlocked and thrown open to the judgment of your sin. But all you have to do is believe in him. Lay claim on him. And you are eternally secure forever. So if you haven't done that, join us and do that. It's sweet to sleep and rest your soul on Jesus Christ alone. Charles Spurgeon said, search scripture through and you must, if you read it with a candid mind, be persuaded that the doctrine of salvation by grace alone is the great doctrine of the word of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, there is not a one of us who doesn't feel that inner legalist searching around for some way we can make ourselves worthy of you. But Lord, you have forbidden us from doing so. And you have told us by the culminating glory of your word that you have saved us by grace alone in Christ alone, through faith alone, for your glory alone. And Lord, I pray for this church, my dear brothers and sisters, and for myself, that Lord, we would rest, trusting in you, saved by the grace of God alone. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.